to keep my introduction super short, by education, I'm a medical doctor and uh, uh, I'm involved in a number of different fields and projects. So today I'm just wearing one of my hats <laughs> talking about this topic. Uh, specifically, I, I, I would like to stress th this um, activity for me crosses the boundaries between medicine and, and uh, military application because both worlds are uh, facing very similar challenges with automation. So um, why, why uh, do, do I talk of uh, autonomous systems or AI in, in, in military application is because I'm also sitting at the NATO STO table of uh, Action HFM 330, which is concerned with the meaningful human control autonomous systems. The, the, the important point here, though, uh, concerning Alberto's introduction is uh, the, the, the table I work at is not really concerned with ethics, although ethics, of course, is the elephant in the room, so it, it's often in reality discussed, but it's not strictly speaking the, the topic of the working group. The working group is, in fact, tasked with uh, identifying the appropriate ways to deploy autonomous systems, guaranteeing meaningful human control, whatever this is in brackets. And it's not really about the ethics of doing so. Okay, it's not even about the ethics of war at all, because th this is the largest question, right? I mean, in, in a sense, it's straightforward when you are dealing with medicine, there's no question about whether you want to care for your patients, okay? And it's just a matter of discussing what are the appropriate tools and uh, how to guarantee inclusion of the humans in the loops of decisions. While in military application, there's a number of questions concerning, uh, well, th th these are ancient questions, as ancient as uh, uh, military theory, like Sun Tzu himself, uh, would favor a war that was won without having to confront your enemy, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> it's uh, it's a bit peculiar. Okay. Now the the, the important point is um, industrially there's a, a significant pressure to translate advances in uh, machine learning into applications for also military purposes, military and security purposes. And this brings with it uh, uh, the mystique that we see accompanying machine learning progress uh, in all other fields. Uh, I guess everyone has uh, heard statistics about uh, Tesla's cars uh, making less uh, accidents in self-driving than the average uh, American driver or things like that, as meaningless as these statistics are, there's in general an, an idea that machine learning properly used is superhuman in performances and that this has to be exploited in applications. And, and of course, military are not uh, born yesterday, they have experience with uh, automatization in other uh, uh, domains of, of application. Uh, th there's uh, very interesting uh, stories, as instance, uh, just GPS. There was this story of a, um, a frigate being uh, kidnapped by jamming the GPS signal so that the navigation system would think it was going in a different place and uh, nobody was able to use a sextant uh, on board. So they just went where the jammer wanted to go. And once they were there, okay, nice email to your command <laughs> saying, hello, <laughs> what do we do with your <laughs> boat? <laughs> Luckily, this was a, a relatively friendly ex exercise, but uh, since then uh, every, uh, 
captain is required uh, again to be able uh, to use a sextant, to be trained, to verify what the machine is telling them. Seems trivial, but this is a, 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 a typical problem with automatization. In this case, the problem was uh, in the tracking domain. So when you are um, thinking of uh, human control of a system, you normally think mostly of two uh, families of uh, problems. These are tracking and tracing. Tracking relates to the idea that the system you are relying upon should be able to capture enough variety of the world and should be able to transmit it to you consistently. And if it has any autonomy in uh, classifying this variety, this autonomy should have a meta layer, sort of, where it captures enough variety of moral reasons for this classification. Classical example of accidents. Again, this was on the newspaper. Uh, American drone killing Afghan people uh, that are having a wedding party. What's the problem? The system identifies uh, rifles. It has no reason to track what use those rifles are for. These people are harmed. They had uh, reason to suspect uh, that uh, terrorists uh, were there. Rifles were weapons. Proof enough, order to eliminate uh, the target. If the system had been able, like a human would have been being there, to capture the context where these uh, weapons were present, the, trackings, the tracking problem would have been solved properly and, and no order would have been issued. This also introduces a tracing issue, a tracing problem. Tracing is about um, how do you reconstruct the chain of decisions that conduct to a certain action? In this case, the drone pilot was there because he had already received a request pointing out to the potential presence of terrorists. This means that his set of decisions were already skewed in the direction of intervention. Imagine a, simple, uh, a simpler example. Bob is a military and his uh, lieutenant or whatever his officer invites him to select uh, a prisoner to be killed. Otherwise, all will be killed. Is he responsible for killing the person? Or is the responsibility for the crime above him with the officer that had set for Bob a condition in which no non-lethal, uh, sorry, no lethal, no, sorry, again, no non-lethal option was available, <laughs> right? So as uh, machine learning applications uh, grow more and more complex, making sure that you are uh, respecting all the criteria to defend the, uh, a, a meaningful human control on lethal decisions. And sometimes non-lethal decisions are not less important. Becomes um, growingly complicated. Uh, there are problems of documentation of reliability as instance uh, other example from literature and uh, a, a famous example, actually, uh, a, a machine learning uh, tool trained uh, to recognize uh, dogs, huskies, and wolves. And this application was uh, impressively effective, okay? Close to 100% of identification of the two objects in, in reported literature. And then independent team comes in, they put some noise, foxes as instance, and the system 
no doubt classifies everything. And what is it they discover? That the training sets evolve is mostly in a natural environment, and ASCII is mostly in human shaped environments. And the system was actually fitting the presence of hood and snow <laughs> or the presence of uh, igloos, uh, sleeves, and all the rest, <laughs> rather than identifying the true object. If you had relied on this system in an appropriate situation, it would have identified the wolf properly. But according to the tracking dimension, you would not have known it was a dog because the system was actually identifying a different thing. And it was just a coincidence that you knew you believed it was a wolf, right? And, and because there's no uh, clear tool today to test what your system is doing in an explainable way for all the most powerful machine learning applications, at least. I mean, academically, I know there are tools, but these are uh, niche applications. This becomes a challenge for the designers of the system, because of course, the reason why you are applying machine learning and automatiz automatization in general, is to speed up your decision making. And if the human has to redo everything on its own, well, why spend the money to begin with? Okay. And if you are accepting that you have to take the risk because speed is an advantage like in finance marketing, and you believe that the other agent will not be as ethical as you and will not worry about mistakes. This is a typical argument at the round table. No need to name the, the other agent. The other agent is of course not ethical. That's not even a question at the table. They will use this no matter what. Why should we refuse it? So it's not a question of whether we should, but we will. And how are we going to do it? And, and this is not a straightforward answer, even from us at the moment. So th this involves uh, both technical criteria for uh, selection of tools very similarly to what you have to do with uh, medicine. You find yourself requesting uh, prospective uh, testing. So the idea is, uh, and it's often criticized by vendors mostly, of course, you can learn equally in historic data, presenting them as perspective, simulating a, pro a, a prospective process or from prospective data, but the difference is you cannot curate real prospective data, right? So typical vendor argument is we already have all this data. We will present them to the machine as if we are simulating time, and we will tell you how this works prospectively in fiction, OK? And our argument is we trust you, but no matter how you collected the data, they are collected. And we want you to do it in closest to real life situation as possible. So as in medicine, after you have trained, tested, and you think your tool is perfect, uh, we want it and we want to run it in simulations, in uh, exercises, and all sorts of scenarios that are not under your control. And we want to document how it performs for real in those, in those circumstances. Now, these, these has limitations, of course, um, especially if you do simulations and, and uh, exercises, as instance, uh, involvement of scenarios uh, where there are pretended civilians um, are often close to zero. So you tend to have 
uh, askewedness of, of your sample in the direction of what you what they have trained for but it's acceptable let's say and and then we request that there's uh, auditing systems so that you can verify postdoc what happened and why in as close to real time as possible constant review of what's going on the other issue is we, we want the system to be as explainable as possible this is of course an extra cost in machine learning so again vendors are not always super favorable but once you have trained with whatever brilliant black box you wanted to use to train your model with once you have trained your model there are mathematical ways to re-encode this model in a different uh, format where it's traceable classical system graph networks okay and and these offer you the possibility to have insight into the internal process that have led the autonomous agent to make a certain decision in classification or to make a certain recommendation which can be reviewed by third parties including other autonomous systems that are in, in competition as instance so not necessarily all the control if you want to really speed up stuff has to be completely human but it it has to have a sort of human feel in, in this idea that you can explain it, challenge it, even if it's happening super fast and that you are receiving outputs that visualize how this confidence score has been reached, whether there was agreement or not, minority report, no, classical, <laughs> okay. And uh, whether there were, um, weak links in the chain of, of this confidence building in your system typical problem is uh, the interface with the human to show the results we in, in in the working group you would be relatively surprised probably to to know there's no designers so we are not able to produce guidelines on uh, how to properly visualize this information even though we know it's uh, extremely important there are uh, uh, stories of uh, fighter planes failing because uh, when the stall alarm was ringing the pilot would reach very quickly for the position where the command of the flaps was and uh, in in the new airplane a very similar design command was in that place, but was controlling the turning off of the engines <laughs> and would cause the pilots <laughs> to uh, sort of commit the suicide of the airplane <laughs> and launching out. <laughs> so uh, presentation of, of information uh, is one of the recommended sensitive points, but we are not able to express our own uh, uh, recommendation on. And, and, and then there is the issue of uh, specifically designing uh, the, the traceability in the chain of command. And, and this is probably the, the, the most challenging issue because this is an issue already in uh, common military operation. So this is, this is something that emerges strongly because of the reflection on meaningful human control on autonomous systems. But in reality, in the military, like in healthcare, there's a number of choices that are, uh, if not really fully engraved in how you have designed your chain of decision and your bureaucracy, they have been at least biased. In, in this design and and this happened much before ml came into the scene and designing uh, let's call it a toyota uh, model 
where uh, the person on the field uh, is able to give uh, his own feedback and uh, yeah, loop up to in, in interfere with decision it is uh, something um, close to impossible in both fields, also in medicine. In fact, if you remember the experience in open care, doctors and caregivers used to say that they were working around the rules sometimes in order to offer the right care to their patients because the system was industrialized for average Joe that was an average human being that was not really existing, but still it was okay to optimize for it economically for the organization. Right, and, and the military system is, uh, of course, a human organization, very similar, same uh, managerial culture. And, 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 and this creates a, a, a bigger challenge than tracking, because paradoxically, tracking is uh, a very technical issue. And if you start educating the policymakers and the decision maker in the military, environment and they become aware of the fact that not everything that uh, glitters is gold uh, also in uh, machine learning research uh, uh, and so forth and so on they do start asking the right questions concerning how the system builds confidence in its use and how the there is consistency in uh, in its applications and, and so forth but uh, um, tracing challenges the status quo of precisely the same people that you are training technically. Because the moment they decide to, as instance, purchase a specific tool, I don't know, as instance, uh, uh, let's imagine we are selecting uh, drones uh, to watch a border because we are in a Cushion territory with bordering a... What is Moscow is silent, Nadia? <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but no, it's, no, it's, okay. uh, <laughs> it's just when, when, um, um, when you have like a, a, a top-down command and control and then you try to reach Moscow, this is when the Berlin Wall fell. It's also, I'll share the okay. <laughs> link to the article. Sorry. No, it's okay. So, so um, imagine you are deciding to purchase drones to watch a border in a Cushion territory that is bordering a warfare area. And then at some point, uh, these uh, drones are simply moving slightly around. GPS interference from uh, other uh, electronic app appliances uh, nearby, um, whatever reason, and then they identify movements and they trigger a warning. This is also a case that really happened. And, and now you are the chain, the decision chain has already decided to rely on this. What, what's your order there, right? It gets extremely complicated because you are already deciding to, to rely on them. And, and these projects on all the decision chain, I, I, I saw the comment of Alberto concerning the Prussian, but you know, the, the, now the, 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 the Prussian army was actually having real world experience in, in war. We are um, exporting freedom since uh, decades, and uh, it's um, it's a bit different from from their experience, right? I mean, uh, the the um, we, we we are seeing now a huge uproar for uh, civil um, casualties, but we didn't see it for Iraqi, Afghan. Uh, I mean, the, the WHO general secretary mentioned uh, Ethiopia, right, uh, recently, and, uh, and there's Yemen, uh, there's uh, Lebanon. So 
uh, our experience has been heavily skewed away from from what was the Prussian Prussian experience. The, the Prussian were uh, fighting. Well, if it was not their home, it was uh, their neighbor, right? Very close to home. They they needed to be effective. They needed to be. Uh, sort of acceptable locally. <laughs> Let, let's say that there was a certain sustainability requirement, right? Imagine uh, Alexander the Great um, conquering uh, everything and trying to accept all the local cultures and uh, be accept be himself accepted by uh, by the ruled. Uh, the the way our military have, have been educated away from from their school okay don't don't, don't think that their education stops when when their uh, formal education interrupts right then they absorb the the culture of of the environment where they are operating and and we have been conducting affair in in a very different way in 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 the last few decades we have been sending um, uh, very often, not even officially military, but contractors. And, and also concerning contractors, uh, their responsibilities and, uh, and, and the way they are uh, interacting with the military is exactly the same way you would expect from uh, you making a contract uh, with, uh, I don't know, Uber to receive uh, cars uh, for the edge riders for uh, let me read for, 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 for whatever movements uh, you need to you need to have yeah in a certain sense it's bureaucrats with guns this is the same problem that you have in in healthcare right i mean the the, the moment the management of healthcare has become professionalized it has gone away from from doctors in a certain sense Probably it has had uh, improvements in many senses because, of course, uh, they have uh, uh, knowledge of a number of uh, best practices and uh, they know how to uh, track uh, money much better than a doctor would and quality certifications and, and everything else. But it separates the management from, from actual experience and the longer this situation goes on, the longer the two cultures drift apart. Uh, Martin, please. You, you're, you're muted, Martin. Yeah. Being Prussian, I find it a little bit difficult the reference to Prussian uh, military experience. Uh, um, yeah, Prussian because I'm German and born and lived in this part of Germany where is the former part of, uh, of Prussia. And by my age, I had my military uh, training, including uh, officer's de degree. But you are not sold, Martin. Yeah. So, I, uh, <laughs> so, no, no, no. So I think there, there is a difference in uh, military tactics and how people are, uh, how far you are on the command and control side or how far you have a mission-oriented approach. But that's not what I would like to uh, develop in. I would like to pick on the bureaucrats keyword. Um, I think we should understand that uh, bureaucracy grown over the last, let's say, 500, 700 uh, years, is a traditional means to standardize and structure processes. So it's a kind of cultural uh, artificial intelligence and learning, which is built into the procedures. OK, it's paper-based and uh, card-based, and you get certain things which, but it is, in the end, it's very close uh, what I see be implemented into artificial intelligence. The speed is a difference today. The amount of information which can be aggregated is a difference. 
and uh, but when I take a certain distance and I listen to stories what went wrong with artificial intelligence uh, judging the snow for the dog and so getting the wolf and the dog wrong uh, doesn't that has a lot of parallelism with stories about how administrative decisions have been taken or administration have been are taken uh, the rules means you look for the shoes of the guys in front of you and you see the shoes and so you know he is a criminal so that's uh so i think the we need in that field a little bit more of uh nuance so what i would like to uh, to learn more is uh, where you see the the new quality which comes in along two lines first the higher speed which makes uh, certainly human intervention far more difficult to say stop this goes into the wrong wrong the, uh, direction and uh, that then maybe that you cannot reach moscow is an advantage uh, which allows you to uh, think a little bit you may take the example from the supposed uh, russian submarine commander uh, somewhere close to Cuba some some decades ago, we simply refused to press the button uh, because there was some inconsistency. In them. So speed seems to be the one uh, element. And the other element is um, our how somehow in our culture built in trust or fundamental mistrust in technology. So I think we find people which are easily because it is an IT tool, it's modern technology, therefore it's good, is reliable by uh, nature, or you find the opposite side. I am um, to share one small experience. It is uh, some years ago when I had, um, when I was commuting between Brussels and a place in Germany, uh, when I had enough time, I was, token, I was taking the local train ride from Brussels to my place, which is possible. You only take local trains. And I was on a very crowded German local, local train, university students coming in, and um, the doors were not uh, closing, and a voice over the loudspeaker said, okay, uh, please stay back from the door so that we can close them, otherwise the train cannot leave. And then I overheard a discussion between two students saying, okay, oh, that is funny that they're asking for this. Uh, uh, they cannot leave uh, if the doors are not closed. This is technically impossible. And the guy was asking why. Oh, that's all tested, was the answer. <laughs> so, uh, so my question is speed and this part of our societies individuals which have a strong built-in reliance of the technical system which believe simply because it is tested it is built the engineers have done their jobs and therefore it will function whatever happens so uh, concerning uh, speed uh, first I completely agree with you that uh, there is a very strong parallel between the emergence of bureaucracy at, at the time and now the emergence uh, of machine learning. And, and in fact, I agree with, with your use of the term uh, industrialization. Machine learning is just an industrialization of some uh, specifically compliance processes. Now the the, the 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 problem with speed, the, the the dimension of speed, it's it's twofold in 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 this kind of applications. One is uh, uh, let's look at it as a value. Okay, uh, the the idea is that if you can pick up signals earlier, or even if you pick up them slightly later but you can react to them faster. You gain a competitive advantage. I think, uh, I don't remember the, the reference by art, but I can share it later. There's a paper 
that was at the very beginning of the digital era um, on trading and and the and this asymmetry of information generating an advantage in trading that was specifically claiming that speed was introducing asymmetries of information even though they were short lasted and if you were able to repeat them systematically then you were actually living in a world that was seeing the future compared to your com competition and and this is the reason why it's extremely uh, difficult in reality to resist completely the application of this kind of uh, solutions because not only intuitively but uh, th there's uh, relatively solid um, theoretical and uh, and practical proof that used appropriately they do introduce strategic advantage now the the, the problem with speed though uh, connects directly with, with the concept of, of human control is that changing speed of something in a system and and you cannot uh, equally industrialize every process is at the same time magically in your entire organization and, and you cannot freeze then this progress uh, in this position changes the the way uh, different parts of your organization interact with this information and 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 these in a sort of sense changes the meaning of, of what is done in the organization means for for other parts of the same organization right so uh, think of the uh, of the example of the frigate uh, and the gps the gps tells you the position instantly right in, in a sort of sense and and this of course is so convenient that as history tells us nobody was uh, learning how to use this extant any longer because it was uh, prone to mistakes it was uh, problematic slow and and whatever but the fact that you were having this uh, very fast and precise positioning tool on board meant that they were not even any longer checking uh, sky or uh, coastlines uh, it was completely changing their relationship to the very act of navigating the availability of this high speed action of positioning this happens uh, in in medicine with this instance uh, um, imaging and uh, molecular diagnostics classical uh, medical wisdom you try to learn as much as possible about uh, your patient uh, the uh, its environment uh, is uh, social inclusion the history the natural history of what happened before the emergence of the symptoms and after the emergence of the symptoms and the complaint and, and and then you try to use these which in the end is time that you are spending as your alley in narrowing down clusters of uh, competing hypotheses and, and potential solutions and the moment in which tools like uh, CT scan or um, molecular laboratory let's say troponin measurements have become commonplace this industrialization of accessing a specific kind of information about your patients made it so that you could have information about what cartilage was inflamed or uh, whether there was a swelling uh, of uh, some organ or uh, uh, an imbibition of the lungs or whatever else very very quickly and similarly you could measure troponin and there's no reason to ask your patient uh, if he was short of breath uh, or uh, how was he training if he had experience of uh, symptoms uh, to the mandible or whatever else in order to suspect uh, uh, cardiac uh, diseases now the, the fact that you access to this information much quicker introduces 
a, a new challenge. The meaning of this information is analogous in a sense, but fundamentally different from the information you were collecting clinically. And, and this is part of what happened in the industrialization of healthcare system. You start moving and, and it's, I believe, completely human, <laughs> you start moving from thinking that you need to focus on outcomes to relying on what you have quickly and confidently measured and to try to be uh, compliant when reacting to this. In, in medicine, this is the advent of pathology around the 70s, when suddenly evidence-based medicine came. And even though it was originally formulated as a triad of uh, uh, relying on uh, studies, uh, gathering uh, proper information and uh, negotiating values and outcomes uh, with your patients, very quickly became, well, this is the scientific evidence. When you have this, you have to do this. This, you know, by measuring this very quickly, and this is what you have to do. And if you have that, you are super lucky, and, and we are super quick in responding. If you don't have that, then there's something that is documented in literature as the Ulysses syndrome, and you have those patients that start changing doctor trying to find a doctor that is willing to look beyond what would have been the direct match if the direct match is wrong. And, and they become owners. This is why they, they become Ulysses because they become owners of this path. The, the system is no longer responsible of any compliance. They have their problem and they have to wander around the system until they find the solution. This is because the introduction of these tools that have sped up some parts of the activity, but not all the parts. I mean, when you know you have high troponin, this tells you a lot about what's going on, but it doesn't tell you very much about what will happen once you do something. And what really is important in this system in theory is what really happens, right? In medicine is about prognosis. You don't come to a visit to have a diagnosis. You come to change your prognosis for the better. Otherwise, I mean, I, I understand the thirst for knowledge, but I'm sure most patients live exactly the same, not knowing what they have or inventing an explanation for what they have. But the difference is that you are coming to change the destiny. And if by speeding up part of the information gathering, you skew all the activity in being compliant to this information gathered, rather than worrying about what happens at the end, you have a perfectly industrialized healthcare system that is compliant with evidences and whatever you want to mention, but a fairly poor patient experience. Now, then we, we can tell each other a lot of stories about why patients bring doctors to a court uh, or, or hospitals to courts and why this is growing and why this is a problem for healthcare spending and whatever, but happy patients don't do that. So th there is a disconnect somewhere in this experience that is due to the fact that now we have suddenly access to very fast information on one side and all the rest has the same speed as, as always. And if we try to push all the system to act at the speed that is available on one dimension, we are changing all the meaning of the intervention in this field. Militarily, we risk the same stuff. If suddenly we have uh, systems that very quickly can detect uh, sound waves, no, maybe sound waves is not good enough because now we have hypersonic uh, missiles, uh, electromagnetic activity, or uh, 
I don't know, by triangulating uh, um, neutrino detection now that there are uh, uh, multiple detectors uh, due to Dunes instance at Fermilab, uh, you can identify activities from nuclear plants that are enriching uranium somewhere, you immediately trigger a, a very fast reaction. Because after all, that, that's speed is the entire reason why you are introducing this. But this changes all the meaning of the actions that you would have conducted normally. So you, I have you, a question. Have, yeah, sorry. Uh, also Martin, one. so Nadia first and then Martin. I... So um, in these discussions, have you developed terms for these phenomena? like or these these tendencies like i don't know the equivalent of speed blindness this you know where you stop paying attention because you have this super fast system that's a particular kind of behavior no okay so for for human specifically there, there is uh, something concerning tunnel attention if i remember right yeah where, where you fall where you focus specifically on, on some details and then you lose context. Uh, I, I'm not aware though if similar things exist for, 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 for entire organizational systems. For, for, oh, for no, I was thinking about in, in the discussion about AI and um, uh, meaningful human control, if there are specific, if there's specific terminology that's emerging, um, okay, so I, I, think, yeah, I understand. I think the, the, the concept of tracing and tracking, although they are universal as names, I, I may be wrong, but I, I've met them for the first time studying uh, autonomous systems, tracing and tracking uh, as, uh, as this concept of tracking, which was the consistency not the compliance between uh, uh, signals and then all the events that happen until the human gets involved in a decision and, and the tracing, which is how you are building the contours where the human can, can take a decision, which means also that skew is decision perspective, right? Speed is one of the, of the problems there. I mean, if you are introducing huge speed on something, in a way, you are constraining the set of decisions that a human can take. You have introduced that speed because it was necessary and the human cannot take one year to verify something that happened in one microsecond. I don't know. It's, uh... so, so it gets complicated. The, the, the famous example that was mentioned by Martin before of, of, of that uh, famous uh, Russian soldier that decided to ignore uh, the, the, the warning system and, and, and not to send the nuke. And, and then everything turned out to be a false alarm and so forth it was basically a gamble, right? I mean, he, he had, it, it's true that there were reasons to be surprised by one warning and not a massive attack. So he had good reasons to, to have some, uh, some doubts about this. But on the other end, he also decided to gamble. If, if somebody in America had, had been uh, funny enough to just send one nuke, they would have taken the nuke without retaliating, right? It's, uh... So in the, in the end, uh, there was a mix of uh, thinking that the, that the warning was not uh, um, agreeing with the common sense of what such an attack would, would have looked like. But it was also a decision to trust humans enough that they would not have gone for a nuclear war uh, in a situation of tension, but without the real escalation of... Uh, mm. So it was a bit... The machine would not have done it, clearly. A machine programmed for this either would have had uh, rules, experience uh, about scenarios where it would have decided one nuke makes no sense, I'm not going to retaliate, or it would have simply fired because 
when you train a system, it doesn't take into account uh, morality or um, desire for survival of the communities uh, around it, right? It's, uh, it's just trained to classify actions uh, and reactions. And then Martin, you wanted to say something? Yes, because I if I pick up where uh, at my last uh, point. If I would be very uh, provocative, I would say uh, artificial intelligence is nothing more than putting bureaucratic process processes to the next technological uh, level. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, we use our best possible experience of the past uh, to train the system that allows us to be uh, effective. Then we have concerns about resources, so it should be efficient. And then we have concerns about what it costs in the end, it should be economic. And then we are, for example, in the case which you described for the medical field, that instead of having a long anamese of what the patient had, you say, okay, I measure this, and, and then I know you have that, and then you get this, uh, this treatment. Uh, this kind of building systems is very conventional that we do this uh, several thousand years since we develop uh, technologies. So I had the point about the difference in, in speed. And uh, now I would like to make the point uh, if one, and I would not like to uh, use an example, uh, nuclear war and this other big, uh, this big issues because they are too far away of my uh, daily uh, experience and the things which I uh, can control or uh, can't control. Uh, so what is the balance which one has to build in between on one side trusting the automatism and the other side uh, checking whether the automatism is right because in, uh, well-designed approach, I don't use the word system, a well-designed approach would say, okay, every other X, Y, Z, you check whether your system is still uh, doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, example, I have an electric car, which is in the end a driving computer. The assistant systems, which I have, uh, allows me not to touch the steering wheel on a countryside road, which good markings left and right. And then the car takes the bends. It looks into the navigation system, slows down before the crossing, up to the point that it nearly, nearly stops. Uh, uh, it asks me to touch the steering wheel any other time, but it does a lot of these operations uh, autonomously. Okay, it's not an autonomous car and it's not about to, supposed to be an autonomous car, but, but what I see there is by building the car, there was a mixture built in of autonomous capacities, uh, driving a banded countryside road with some simple, simple crossings under good markings and calling regular on the driver to touch the steering wheel so that he is still taking operation. So that's for me an example for how I would like to see artificial intelligence being used in many fields. Huh? Huh? So uh, what is now, do you have any experience, what is the rule of a okay. thumb? Huh? Okay, so, so, so it, it, it's interesting that you use that example because actually it's an example of bad design. Ah. <laughs> so one of the uh, unsolved problems in um, assisted driving, let's not call it self-driving. Uh, one of the unsolved problems there is um, the um, transition between machine control and human control during emergency. And, and that's why the car invites periodic contact with the, with the steering wheel. Steering wheel. 
uh, other systems are now tracking the eyes or stuff mm. but in general they they that's why they are trying to they are trying to force the human at the wheel to still remain engaged in in the driving because one of the issues of of um, assisted driving is specifically that humans are not super cool at um, not, not super good <laughs> at uh, intervening when they are suddenly called to action and they had lost contact with the context. Yeah, they, they take time and I'm a slow processing speed, only some bits a second and I have this high influx of information, I have to push things aside and suddenly I hit the tree which suddenly jumped into my way. As, as <laughs> instance, right? I mean, so... So what could happen? You, you are relying on the system. I have a similar system and uh, you may be relying on that specifically because as instance, you wanted uh, a mouchoir or <laughs> you, you wanted to focus on drinking or um, checking on yeah. your daughter behind. And, yeah. and of course you are relying on this because you wanted to take out your attention from, from, from the driving. And if everything goes well, the driving is competent in doing precisely within its limit what it needed to do. Um, classical example, the car in front of you is uh, slowing down or even making an emergency brake, your car will do the same. No doubt. It, it's programmed for that. Now, a, a trickier situation, but a realistic one, is the car in front of you breaks and avoids the obstacle in front. And now your car that was yeah. measuring the speed of the car in front and suddenly as a stopped thing, not something that is braking, simply will not have the reaction time and it will go in and it will not even be able to steer, just brace, <laughs> okay? And, and there's not a simple uh, procedure to pass this responsibility to humans. Uh, an, a, an example in, in industry of this was the um, Boeing uh, 737 MAX uh, series mm -hmm. of accidents. Yeah. Okay. The, the system was uh, working at steady state very well to save uh, um, gasoline consumption yeah. but sometimes this was inducing a stall in maneuver uh, like taking off and, and, and taking down and at the stall the system was playing an alarm and the human needed to perform a rather complicated set of action humans that had specifically been trained for that had familiarized with the practice like a martial artist would, right? Enough that they would start doing before even coming again in contact with the context because it, this was their reflex, sort of trained reflex. And all the other pilots, I mean, unfortunately we know airplanes crashed and people died. This was due to the fact that there was a poor engineering of this uh, ending over strategy, which required the user to be specifically trained. Okay. Now, the, the, if, if you are trying to apply the, this, uh, this kind of systems in uh, uh, open world situations, like the driving, hmm, it's not easy to train the user to repeating a specific maneuver like it would happen on the Boeing case. Okay, in the Boeing case, uh, turning off the system, switching on again, uh, letting it uh, with the nose down and, and, and removing would work. But in, in the case of a car, making a stereotype maneuver could actually kill other people. You need to be aware of the context to decide what maneuver you want to do. 
because you are normally driving in traffic or you're, you may be driving uh, close to a waterway, uh, the sea, the trees uh, or, or whatever else and, and have risks for yourself and for the other. So in, in that case, it, it is still an open issue today what would be a good end over maneuver. And that's why there's a limitation to the autonomy level certification of cars. Even the American car um, seller that is extremely aggressive on Twitter about uh, his cars uh, driving alone to the point of calling it uh, uh, full self-drive is, uh, is not uh, beyond, I think it's called, it's level two at the moment in the US actually, not even level three. Okay. And, and the reason is the difficulty of documenting a proper working in, in real world and over sequence of actions for an emergency. So even though it drives relatively well, I mean, of course, then the web is full of failure mm -hmm examples uh, and i mean it, you you can spend afternoons on youtube watching automatic system failing <laughs> but uh, apart from that uh, the, the problem is not that they fail because even humans fail the problem is that it's not easy to design an appropriate ending over and and then you create a void of responsibility between the system documenting that it was requesting the action of the user, but the user actually not being in the context. And, 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 and the ultimate responsibility for this, if you had or load a higher autonomy certification would have been to the policymaker. So the policymaker simply doesn't allow it. The company markets the way they want, but the user is ultimately responsible for what he does, even if he decides not to, not to drive, even if he decides to let it drive itself. A bit like he would be responsible driving after getting drunk. But that means in the end, it boils down uh, to this use of this artificial intelligence in order to help me in situations where I would like to gain speed, uh be cheaper so whatever you we, if we mentioned is the balance between running things in this automated mode and when how uh human intervention is brought in in order to check that things are, are, are perform uh, well my car calls me so often to touch the steering wheel that i um cannot uh, turn to the back and follow uh, follow my daughters. And it's still a challenge. Uh, and what is interesting, when you switch in the heating system for the steering wheel, that system gets uh, blurred. It asks not so frequently. So that is an interesting. Okay. <laughs> it is exciting. <laughs> so you have discovered the trick already. <laughs> yeah, I look for it because I've, I, would, I, I was interesting where is he? And because the, the overall problem is the... Uh, is the same. And uh, that I tell you as being more than 25 years having worked as bureaucrat. Huh? So you have your set of procedures, you have your set of standardized things, and there is the question, what is the amount of intervention which you allow, which you expect, which you build in the system? Uh, are there points in uh, that the automated control goes off? Huh? For example, the artificial intelligence having checked uh, radar screen, uh, radar images for certain identifying illness. They said, okay, I checked now uh, 100 images. The next five I don't do. I would like to see what my operator thinks about it. Is there anything like this discussable? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. So, so the, the, these. Um these strategies of how to use it or alternate and th these are all on the table. The, the problem is really defining uh, the acceptable failure, right? So if, if you in, in, in medicine or in, um, or in the military application, lethality is mm. 
almost the obvious result of your uh, of your uh, mistake. If mm. if you are not lethal, you are anyway compromising quality of life uh, in the long term. In a car, if you are driving in town, probably you are just ruining your car and the car of another person, and 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 you will hopefully come out unscathed by by today technologies and speed limits, right? Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> so. There's uh, there's this uh, problem of um, e even when you are alternating, like the the, mm -hmm. the way you propose, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you were doing one and one, the responsibility of that one in which you are relying on the machine should still yeah. build on you being fully able to control it, even if you are relying on speed. And 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 this is the most challenging part. It's challenging because you have to guarantee the tracking problem. This is not always obvious. There are strategies. You can actually even use alternative machine learning system, as I was mentioning, as adversarial system, so that you constantly have the possibility of minority report among them. They are trained on different sets. They are taking care of different parameters. They come to decision if they don't agree they tell you, okay, we are unable to do it, right? Imagine radar and the leader giving you different information about uh, the speed and the mass yeah. of the object in front of you. And they tell you, okay, we are unable to proceed. So you are on but, your own, but right? It means we are, we are back with this, oh, no, we are not back. We are with a discussion in a cultural sphere. So where a certain type of society, a certain group of people or certain individuals accept things done automatically, uncontrolled, or don't accept it. There are guys yeah. in, in private life which check, um, which ask you, did you close the front door? You say yes, and the person goes over, ah, yes, it's, uh, it's closed. Uh, and there are other daily lives. So that's, I think, does not these things make makes sense and why we make so much uh, fuss, excitement about this artificial intelligent use, this automated system, where when we take a certain distance saying, okay, we have hundreds of these kind of technologies around us, which we use in a, in a, in a certain, certain way. And the only thing which I can see, I can see two things which makes us uncomfortable with their relying on these kind of machines uh, is the speed which we cannot compete and the amount of inform input information which we can uh, digest in a certain amount of time which is even when we in a very holistic way operating cannot uh, cannot cope with so you, you are proposing me actually more than one question but okay <sighs> The, 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 the problem of trust is a very interesting problem. Um, and, and it has a bit to do with how we are dealing with our society, even before we end up to machine learning specifically or technology specifically. Uh, we, we have seen it with, uh, with the pandemic, okay? Mm -hmm. there's, um, there's a certain narrative that is offered in, in the education system and that is then maintained through the um, divulgation ecosystem, journals, uh, radios, and whatever, that, that uh, tries constantly to force human investigation to reach truth. Okay, and if, if you, 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 have, you are a physicist yourself, so, so you are familiar with this consideration, we don't know if we are reaching the truth, right? We, we are having useful models hmm? mm. and these models could actually be even very far away from the truth, okay? They, we are refining them and, and this is why sometimes there's uh, paradigm shifts, but even our paradigm shifts, we cannot necessarily believe that they are getting us closer to the truth. They are getting us more useful models of what we were studying and measuring. Which then, by the way, if we consider that uh, 
the, the, the matter and energy we, we measure is estimated to be 4% of the universe, right? Then there's dark energy and dark matter. <laughs> <laughs> tells us very little about how the <laughs> how the reality outside is uh, is made of even if we consider that uh, dark energy and dark, dark matter are just known unknowns right it's not like they are things they are known unknowns of our models we know there should be something explaining a certain range of phenomena we estimate this something to have these uh, effect sides and 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 we have no clue what it is we have competing theories and, 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 and so forth. And, and, and this happens in, in all other fields. It's not just uh, fundamental physics. I mean, in medicine, we have uh, very comfortable narratives about how the human body works, uh, what is an individual and, and all the rest. But in reality, as we progress in research, uh, we keep discovering uh, that individuals uh, don't even hold uh, genetic identity within themselves. I mean, my neurons accumulate mutation during development and then aging so much that it's more likely that one of my neuron is similar to yours than they are similar to one of my myocardiocytes. Okay, and, and then we have uh, bacteria living with us uh, on the skin, in the bowel, then we have um, viruses living with this bacteria living with us uh, and then we discover that uh, t cells are using nanotubes to kill cells uh, and that uh, macrophages uh, uh, transfer um, mitochondria to each other and sometimes cancer cells take mit mitochondria from them and so forth and so and so on i mean th there's so much we don't know right and and uh, and of course no matter at what time we take a snapshot of human knowledge and, and technology and, and what we popularize at that moment, we are not having any truth. There's not a ground truth. Um, the, the, the definition of what a gene is has changed, um, I think, uh, 50 times in the last 20 years. It's, uh, and, and nevertheless, then, uh, Education and, and scientific communication tends to offer the idea that we have evidence and scientific truth and follow what science tells you. And it's crazy because, I mean, science most of the time tells us what we don't know, right? <laughs> science is extremely good at telling us, okay, <laughs> we have a new limit for what we don't know. <laughs> and then people tell, okay, follow science. No. We are not talking of the same science, right? <laughs> We're not talking about the same science, but again, we are back in the, we are in a cultural philosophical sphere where we belong. So I have no problem with that. Uh, and, um, my punchline to that is um, we as individuals, we are a society, but that is outside the scope of that uh, lecture and the discussion here, are very bad accepting uh, a situation where we say, I, I don't know. Ignorance, ignoring, not having the answer, it is a kind of horror de vacui, uh, which we immediately fill with uh, something which provides us an explanation. So it's true, but in reality, there's a very long tradition. I mean, even Chinese and Indian philosophers were, were concerned with how to deal with risk and unknown. And, and then most of good statistics. Of course, then there's a, a lot of statistical research that is no comment, but good statisticians over the centuries have left us with, with a lot of wisdom about how to deal with uh, inequalities, with uh, asymmetries of uncertainty, and how to sometimes even benefit from this, right? The, the problem is that that requires strong responsibility from leadership. If you assume leadership, un unless you are letting everyone be free, and, and this is a, a powerful strategy for humans. We are very diverse. Some will be more cost than others, but mm. we will survive, right? It's, uh, 
and, and if we help each other in this diversity, some will pay some prices, but mutualizing how we respond to failure in this diversity, we will have room for, for getting forward together. But if you establish some sort of uh... Alberto, you ask me prescriptive or descriptive statement, which one? That we have diversity? I'm actually asking Ricardo. The, the ah, sorry, okay. Mess sorry. Mm -hmm. No, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, it sounds... I, I had missed uh, that. With the human factor and, and boundary is one of trade-off and yields between speeds. I think it's a descriptive, so I was trying to uh, synthesize my understanding of, uh, of, of the situation, making uh, in my head parallels between uh, the, the navigation metaphor um, and uh, with the both with the GPS and uh, with the autopilot, both in cars and uh, and airplanes. Yeah, no, no, no. But but I think you you got the gist. So mm -hmm. the, the the and and also Martin is, is, is extremely wise. So the the the, 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 the crux of all of this is that uh, um, like every industrialization, we we can industrialize confidently processes where we have somehow artificially eliminated uncertainty or reduced uncertainty to the point that we can expect a result given an action. Uh, so automotive industry, speaking of cars again, is one of the most industrialized, right? Because uh, you, you make a good project, uh, you just have to measure the um, uh, tolerances in, in your pieces and assemble them, measure that they are well assembled, and you can automatize almost the entire production of the car. Th this doesn't work super well in medicine because we are huge balls of unknowns circulating. Even if we measure with a very high precision what we are able to measure today, there's so much we don't know about the biology of the humans and, and then about the social components of health and, and, and so forth, that we cannot easily and confidently automatize and industrialize healthcare. Because we are trying to speed up and, and, and rely on compliance on something that has a, still a huge and impressive uh, uncertainty. And, and, and now to get to, to one of Martin's uh, questions, the, the reason why there's so much appeal in, in AI is because the other name of AI is machine learning, right? And, and there's this mystique that uh, machines, because they can churn data at speeds and volumes that are impossible to humans, that they would be able to learn constantly at depths that are impossible to us. This mystique is... Um, uh, constantly sustained by communications like those that surrounded uh, AlphaFold. When, when AlphaFold uh, was announced, uh, it looked like uh, machine learning had solved uh, the folding problems in proteins. And of course, if you ignore all the work that the team in AlphaFold had, had to put in the pre-processing of data, in actually inventing new ways of elaborating crystallography data so that then they would be of any value to a machine learning approach. And then only at the end, putting some layers of machine learning anyway in a complicated design that was not self-designed by the system, but designed by them to maximize certain asymmetries in the learning process. AlphaFold would have never solved anything. In that context, though, it's true that at the very top of this entire process, where they had been peeling off a lot of uncertainty for, from the data they were starting from, then AlphaFold has automated and sped up hugely the reconstruction of very consistent 3D folding patterns for certain families of, of proteins that humans by end would have 
put ears to perform. But it was still humans doing a lot of the brute force work, right? And, and then identified a, a, a structured enough field of application, AlphaFold worked well. It's not like they could take AlphaGo that had learned uh, the Go, the, the Chinese uh, chess uh, game, and, and told AlphaGo, since you are so smart, study the protein folds. Those are two completely different things. They are relying on uh, reinforced, reinforced learning and similar learning strategies, but they are two completely different applications. They are industrializations of specific human tasks. And, 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 and then, Alberto, I, I will let you the, 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 the word. This, this is a common problem also in management. How often do you listen to management people discussing uh, managerial tools like uh, uh, Six Sigma, Lean, uh, Agile, uh, Scrum, and, and claiming that whatever they are uh, bringing the flag off is the right tool for every job. And, and we know it's not like that, right? Six Sigma performs extremely well if you are in a low noise situation because you are just uh, caring about efficiency and a, a, eliminating as much waste as possible from the process and streamlining stuff. But if you are doing uh, research like in physics, uh, well, you are much more in, in an agile setting where you know a lot of things will fail and you want to design to fail in a smart way, like most experiments do ultimately, right? CERN before the huge uh, success of identifying something that looks close enough to the Higgs for decades have failed to identify it, right? And every experiment have just put better boundaries to what they were looking for. And, and if they had worked in a Six Sigma fashion after the lab, they would have closed shop because there was no way to be efficient and, and finding the X. So, uh, Alberto, sorry, you wanted to... Um, no, okay, uh, two, two things. One housekeeping is yeah. uh, we, are, we are now heading towards uh, the hour and a half of, uh, of seminar, so maybe we should start thinking about wrapping up. But we have and decimated then... our audience. So... <laughs> <laughs> but... Yeah, just being mindful of the time we're still here. Uh, and in, in terms of the um, actual discussion, it seems like we're saying two things. We are saying, uh, or rather, we are saying mostly one thing, which we knew already, and that is that uh, automation works best uh, in uh, specific uh, context-specific settings. This is, there is an analogy with uh, the philosophy of data in the. Uh, human sciences in social sciences where you can make a perfectly convincing argument that you should interpret uh, the frequency count uh, in Tolstoy's war and peace in a certain way but that is not possible to this argument is not possible to make it to abstract completely from who Tolstoy is, what language he was writing in, and, uh, and, and other information that are not immediately uh, available to a simple frequency counter of strings. Fair enough. The yes, other but, thing that we are yeah, saying yeah. is that, uh, going back to the issue of time, so if, if it is recognized that it is desirable to slow things down, the ability to do so depends on the strategic context. Example, in finance, uh, there is a, a general idea that hot money is bad. The, the outcomes for um, overall uh, well-being well is, uh, is uh, lower when money moves too fast. And you could, in theory, uh, decide that you want to regulate your 
financial transactions and your assets, then you need to hold to them for a certain minimal minimum period of time, and that will reduce the volatility in your financial markets. However, you can only do it if you can do it, which means everybody plays ball or there is a central authority that is able to punish people who don't want to do that. Now, a military context is, in the end, your, your colleagues at the NATO table, Marco, are presenting the city as a straightforward prisoner's dilemma. War becomes worse if everybody sort of shoots from the hip at a, at a speed that no chain of command is able to be accountable for. But since the enemy is going to do it, then Nash equilibrium means we also do it. And that's, and that's a fairly trivial argument. It's not necessarily wrong. It depends on specifics. But it seems that's yeah, so, what we so are. Yeah, in a certain sense, this is our conundrum at the table anyway. But th th there are two two problems. W one is uh, okay. You you set the um, the context right. So you 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 automatize a, a certain set of actions, and you are deciding already the destiny. If if you are deciding like in alpha fold, let's trivialize with alpha fold that your system has to solve the problem of folding proteins, and you are pre-processing crystallized proteins of a certain kind and giving them, it will work flawlessly. But you are already deciding that that's everything that, that, that's going to happen. So in, in a way, okay, the, the problem of automatizing, of introducing autonomous systems on, on uh, Warfield means that you have to have a very responsible chain of command above because you are it's the same as sending the nuke okay by now you have to agree that if you are deploying it you are giving up control and if you are giving up control it's like the nuke you don't pull the trigger until you have decided that uh, okay there's no longer uh, survival options and, and, and this is an argument that is not accepted as instance. You, you would find extremely interesting that most of this conversation continue to revolve around the idea that we need to involve humans in the loop, mostly because Mr. President or uh, his generals, they don't want to be held responsible for deploying it. So this deployment as to ensure that there is still a chain of command responsible behind them below right it's not like the nuke and 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 the other issue is so so we, we risk a theater of of, uh, of human control right you, you agree with this the, the the great challenge is that what we risk is getting to the point where we make a theater of meaningful human control. The, the other issue that, that you raise is, a, is again a sort of false um, prisoner dilemma in, in the sense that in assuming that the other party is going to do it, you are already assuming in your scenarios that there's no alternative. I mean, we are all living this now in Ukraine, this instance, okay? There, there's basically no diplomatic effort after Biden has gone to Poland on the basis of a number of reciprocal accusation, true or wrong. The idea is un until the last Ukrainian is there, the US are fighting the Russians, right? That's more or less, even the entire idea that the Ukrainian is a as people have the right to self-decide on defense and so forth, it's the classical misuse of the people concept where people doesn't exist, right? It's a construct. It's not like they have gone every Ukrainian asking anything. This is the same that happens in politics. This is the same as uh, 
um, Europe delaying the imposition of new um, um, measures against Russia because they don't want to extremize France in their election towards Le Pen, right? In very interesting concept of how a country self determines itself. If the other countries are skewing this decision by delaying decisions that have already been taken, so they, they are not even at the table any longer, but just so that they will not be in the horizon during the decision. So you see, the, this goes constantly back to the tracing problem. The tracing problem is the really hard problem here. Tracking is completely technical, I insist. You define your criteria to identify a domain where you can apply it or not. And you decide, I'm confident applying it here, I'm less confident here, I'm not confident applying it here, so it should not happen. But the, the true problem gets to tracing. If you are designing these conditions in a way that you want to pretend there is meaningful human control, but that this meaningful human control is transformed into a Strowman argument, because your scenarios are already foreseeing the deployment of these from somebody else. They are already foreseeing that uh, everything is going to happen. We, we go back to the question about Bob having to decide uh, which prisoner to kill, or otherwise everyone will be killed. Is Bob responsible of, of anything? Right? It's. Uh, you create a mock-up uh, scenario in which the, the conversation seems very heated at the table, but, but you are not longer discussing anything relevant to the original question. And, and, and this is a bit the, the entire problem. At the table, we are seriously trying to figure out how to communicate both the problems of tracking and tracing, not strictly with the hope of, of paralyzing deployment, because as I told you, there's division at the table itself. There's some people that would confidently say, well, war is anyway not our first choice. Let's try to avoid war. And, and then let's try to have automatized only what could be automatized and, and the rest will still be responsibility of humans making decisions for our for other humans. OK? and and. Let's keep it personal so that we lower the chances of monstrosity. And, and you know, I mean, Nazism monstrosity was bureaucracy monstrosity, right? The same that can happen with automation. So, and other people are saying, well, no, let's make cr criteria that uh, safeguard everyone, but also allow room for innovation and marketing and continuous research, which is not necessarily in conflict with us if we find the right balance between tracking and tracing, making people understand that this tracing can go very up in the hierarchical system. Of course, if you are just implying uh, Worst case scenario for everything, uh, well, you can just send the nuke, right? If you want to be faster than everyone else, just send your nukes. What are we even discussing about? Yes, um, uh, Martin mentioned it. Uh, it's, a, it's a profound intuition. I had not thought about it, but we are really replicating the same basic logic of bureaucracy, yeah. whereby uh, if you are a poor bastard stuffing the counter that processes the application for refugee visas, you are not allowed to judge the situation as it is. Somebody has framed it for you in, in, a, in a kind of uh, um, formal list of papers that need to be there and uh, and so that's how 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 you operate uh, within a framing that is profoundly 
um, influential, I would say even violent, uh, on, on your uh, job description, which is, after all, that of helping refugees to apply for residency permits in Belgium or whatever. So, yeah. Uh, and again, it's done in the interest of speed. Actually, if we as anthropologists follow this line of thinking, the book by Scott has kind of unmasked this uh, in the case of bureaucracy, not of artificial intelligence, but I wonder how far it, the analogy extends. And it, 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 he unmasked the fact that it is not true that bureaucracy is necessarily faster. What it does do is it reinforces the power of the state actors. That unambiguously it does. Everything else, it is not clear. Well, if, if you look at, uh, at the work of researchers like uh, Abeba Birane, no? you find that there's literature stating the same about AI and ML, right? The, the entire concept uh, that there's uh, the possibility to unbiased data as instances, uh, completely artificial uh, nonsense uh, to the responsabilize uh, the researchers. But in reality, data are biased by definition because you are measuring something with something in mind. And, and I mean, you would not even be measuring. <laughs> Absolutely. It was not a bias, right? Absolutely. It's, uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so th this is again. This is not to say that I'm against or, or that I'm that I think all innovation uh, should be stopped and we should go back to <laughs> tribal uh, lifestyle. But we should be a bit more um, skeptical, disillusioned. I don't. I I, I don't know what what the right word would be. I'm, we have a lot of experience with automatizing stuff in, in different ways along human history. Of course, with different tools as, as we have, as our technologies have developed with different speeds resulting out of them, with different breadths of, of uh, reach. Absolutely, I understand the appeal of machine learning, being able to classify huge and, and to model huge data sets. Uh, it's completely impressive what they achieve uh, when some specific applications of machine learning are able to extrapolate um, laws of motion from data point measured in time uh, as uh, Kepler did when, when he was uh, tracking the planet's motion uh, and extracting their, their laws. S super impressive. But we are, in, in this uh, conversation, we are too often, not we at the table, but um, outside of this, uh, <laughs> of this call, we are too often uh, selling very short human intelligence and, and exaggerating the value of having access to all this uh, data and, 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 and the speed of classification of this data. For a critical approach to AI, as an, yeah, <laughs> Ricardo. <laughs> so it's um, it, ultimately at the moment, despite all the huge claims of uh, beating humans uh, here and there, uh, there's we, we really need to yet. To, witness any breakthrough where machines have done gloriously better than humans for real. And, and when I say better than humans, I mean without humans behind them, right? I'm, if, if you are uh, comparing AlphaFold with other group of research uh, in, in protein crystallography and AlphaFold had uh, over 100 bioinformaticians working on crystallography alone for the preprocessing, it was by far the largest team involved in this uh, effort working uh, side by side. 
you, you would have expected great results anyway if you were funding these many people uh, even without machine learning. And in fact, they invented new metrics to evaluate the, the crystallography data before feeding them to the machine. So that there was relevant IP produced by humans working in, in all of that. And uh, when uh, Alpha Zero won chess uh, uh, playing the game uh, in a surprising way, it turned out <laughs> that it was playing a chess style that had become less popular because of, of, of chess softwares. Because until the 50s, people were playing chess by playing space on the chessboard. And with the advent of, of chess computers, a new style came where value was attributed to specific pieces and, and you were playing by pieces. And Alpha Zero won by playing by space. And humans relearned really to play the style of chess that they had, yeah, by space, that they had played for centuries. Okay, and, and even, a, yeah? I have a I think we need at least two or three hours or days more with the discussion, Alberto, which we don't have. So I think I would like to drop out uh, in a minute or two. Okay. Um, I like that discussion very much. I, it, enforced my view, maybe it's biased, that artificial intelligence uh, should be seen as just the, uh, the new twist of things which we are doing, human doing since centuries. I think uh, the mercantilist societies of the uh, 16th and 17th century, building up first bureaucracies on states based, uh, we're just uh, having the same hype as we see now when we look at artificial intelligence. And we should like any other, in any other situation, and I think Alberto, that would be uh, the one and a half hour or one and a half days discussion. Can we think humans without their technology? Or at any moment in time, we are a twin between the wetware in quotes, which we are, and the technology which we are, which we are using, which we are having, which we are mastering. Mastering. So, uh, yeah, that means you have four legs uh, um, <laughs> if you are set down. So, um, I think that's uh, that's for me something which came again relatively clear. So the question is how we make best use, how we make good use of these new tech tool which we have in our, in our toolbox. And there I uh, carry home uh, to look more in the issue of speed huh? and uh, to, I learned uh, to pay attention to the question switching between the tool being autonomous and the intervention of the uh, human master. Uh, by the way, uh, is there um, many difference between this kind of situation and a mechanic uh, spinning side, a tool making side? where people 50 years ago started crafting things out of metal and they let run the machine for a certain time, looked on how the uh, knives were working, said, okay, now I have to twist a little bit more. Now I have to do the human inter inter intervention. So it's uh, very, thank you very much, Marco. Very, uh, very rewarding uh, the discussion with you and, uh, and colleagues here. So. Thank you, Martin, actually, for, for your uh, lively interaction, because it, it has definitely made the, the, the entire uh, event a, a lot more valuable. I, I would not have, I'm sure I would not have said everything that we said together if I had been alone talking. In, uh, so definitely, thank you. And, and thank you everyone for your patience and, and your comments also, Ricardo. <laughs> okay. So Alberto, we...
update eventually to another uh, meeting if uh, we, we can yes. on a friendly basis anyway, even uh, not necessarily for the public. Absolutely. Uh, can I ask you to to yeah. wrap up uh, what you understand to be the, the further discussing points so they stay archived on the video? Okay, so. <clears throat> yeah, just a couple of bullet points. It doesn't need to be a big, big thing. One <clears throat> central issue of this conversation is the definition of uh, meaningful human control, right? We discussed uh, the tracking and tracing uh, criteria, but there's uh, the entire problem of designing both the interactions between operator and tools and the scenarios in, that they are trying to solve. We have the, the issue of uh, conflicting um, optimizations in uh, we could say in general in society, specifically in, in these fields of application, of course, uh, there's a, pu a strong push from those that are researching uh, these technologies that are uh, developing specific applications uh, and they're not uh, necessarily prepared decision makers that uh, sometimes lean a bit too much on on evidences proposed by one part without challenging them sufficiently. Uh, th then we have uh, a, a wider uh, challenge that was also pointed out by Martin, which is in general our uh, uh, social technical evolution, if you want, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah that uh, is of course uh, an, a non-trivial issue. I, I can tell you from what I know from medicine that it's not really possible to separate us completely from from our technology, Martin, to, 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 but I think your, your question was actually rhetorical and, and you were implying uh, so already. Yeah. Um, and, and then there's uh, this uh, unsolved problem. I, I don't know of a formalism that allows us to study how uh, meaning evolves when parts of a system get uh, accelerated. So we, we only have limited evidences, as I mentioned, mostly from economy concerning uh, these creations of asymmetries of information that can be maintained by repeating the operations of measurements at higher speeds, but we don't know precisely any formalism to keep track of how the meanings gets negotiated differently when things are sped up. This is also partially because we are very bad at the moment in formalizing any ways of emergence of, of meaning in systems, <laughs> even when we consider the system quasi-static. <laughs> but um, that's, I, I think this is, uh, um, this more or less captures the, the, the the gist of our conversations, uh, of course, specifically concerning uh, wartime applications, uh, there is a, th this consideration that, that I was proposing that too often all these conversations seems to find the, the as the ultimate solution, the confrontation, while it should be even in the military um, culture as it was in the art of war in Sun Tzu, as instance, <laughs> considered that many conflicts can be solved ahead of a confrontation. And we could try to leverage some of these tools, redesigning ways of diplomacy and communication, even if they are semi-weaponized in those contexts. That sounds lovely. I've been taking notes, uh, and so uh, okay. Let's uh, let's call it quits, and then um, what what's going to happen now in the next few days is that I'm going to to, to put the um, the video online, and probably also a post uh, on, on Edge Riders pointing to the video, and with maybe a few notes, so that there is some kind of record of what we've been saying, and then we can. Um,
we can think about uh, having a, a follow-up discussion, maybe starting from the post. So directing it and say, what, what do people want to want to go deeper in, and then we 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 can then have a more targeted discussion. Uh, this Thank one is targeted based just by, by, by your own experience, Mark, on, on the SNAP table. But now it looks like the conversation wants to move, uh, I would say, to a more philosophical ground, yeah. to a higher level of generality somehow. It seems to be relevant for AI and even, like Ricardo said, for technology in general, not just for uh, a defense application. So, Alberto, thank you for uh, inviting all of us. And, and thank you, Martin, again for your... Bye-bye uh... to all. Thank Bye. you for coming. It was fun. Yeah, it was Bye. fun. Thank you. So. Thank you. It's been great. Cheers.